Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Jesse. I'm not Paul. Hi, Jesse. Um, so I always like to start by sharing, by saying I don't like to share. Um, it doesn't come naturally to me. It doesn't make me comfortable. It's not something that I like to do. Um, but I do it because when I first got sober, and in every meeting I've been to, um, somebody's gotten up and done it for me. And so when I think about it that way, it gets real easy. Um, and uh, the stories I've gotten to hear and the strength that I've gotten to witness and uh, the intimate details of people's lives that people have shared with me is something that I can't help but um, try to give back as much as I can. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep it the story brief so I can get to the recovery because so I think everybody's kind of suffered a lot of the same details and stuff. Um, I grew up to... An alcoholic, uh, single mother, raising six kids. Uh, my dad left when I was about a year old, um, and alcohol and drugs were just sort of like around. They, uh, they were persistent. Um, it was like, uh, it was the utility that always got paid. Like, uh, the other utilities could go out, but there was always going to be beer, and there was always going to be pot in the house. That was kind of a given. Uh, so that was fixed. Um... Uh, and I myself kind of like I was never very good at it like I wasn't a very good drinker and I guess that's a good thing Um, I think the first time I uh, was bored enough I was uh, 13 years old I think I stayed home from school and uh, my mom's shit kicker boyfriend had a bottle of vodka that he kept on top of the mini fridge next to his water bed and I um I was I was bored and I was depressed and so I thought I'd have some. And I did what I guess other kids do. I don't know where we learned this, but I started to replace the vodka with water, thinking I would get away with that. And by the end of the day there was no more vodka, it was only water. And um I was face down in the bathroom with my arms around the toilet, and uh that's as good as my drinking got. Like that was it. Like as far as like uh uh, uh, executing choice and, this, and critical thinking, that's where it got me. Uh, drink all of it and don't leave any for anybody else. Um, and so my mother's shit kicker boyfriend comes home. And uh, so I really think I'm going to be in trouble. And I sort of crawl into bed as best I can and kind of like make myself small. And uh, he comes into the room and kind of jostles me and wakes me up. And uh, he opens his hand, and he has a bunch of pot. And he's like, here, um, this is free. This is my job. Like, during the day, I, this is what I do. So you can have all of this you want, but just, just don't touch my stolies. <laughs> so that was a consequence. So those were the consequences of my actions. <laughs> cool. Um. And, uh, and, and I really liked, uh, I, I, was really, I really thought I was good at getting high. Um, I really thought I was good at getting high and listening to psychedelic music in the dark. And, uh, and I liked it. And uh, I thought I decided at some point that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And um, I was a creative and I was an artist and I got rewarded for um, my creativity and I kind of, like, leveraged uh, drinking and alcohol to, like, inspire me and inspire sort of, like, creative visioning and things like that. And um, and it worked for, like, a long time. It worked, and I got away with it. And, um, and I was a chameleon, and I kind of blended in. And I... I'm nervous. And I, uh, I always hid behind a bigger, louder drunk or drunk, like the kind of drunk that made a mess, the kind of drunk that made noise, and um, in that way, I never had to kind of look at my own alcoholism, I never had to deal with it, and um, and then I married one, right, uh, and so I, I, I married uh, the loudest alcoholic that I could find, and I could always point at her and say, like, she's got a problem, and um, 
and I would always have to walk her home. <coughs> and uh, I would walk her home, and I'd put her in bed, and, uh, and I would keep drinking. And so the truth was, I was drinking <coughs> twice as much as her. And none of my friends knew I was drinking, because I did it when the doors were closed. And, um, and so when I finally told people I had a drinking problem, they just they didn't understand. They never saw it. They're like, what are you talking about? Uh, and it was only after getting sober, kind of like looking back on like my habits, what I was doing in those late hours after everybody else went to bed, <clears throat> and after my um, my loud drunk partner was passed out, was I was playing God. Um, I was um, sort of like uh, manipulating, making plans, and sort of like um, sort of like uh, thinking about what could come next. And like I I I. Uh, uh, just because that's what I did. And so, um, and I was able to push it away, and I think there's this quote that's my favorite quote in all the AA literature. Uh, we were unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. So I only had one blackout. I only had one seizure. I only wrecked one car. And so I could always kind of like pass it off. And then um, uh, I, I beat up my wife, my ex-wife. And, uh, and in that moment, I realized I don't get to do this anymore. Um, I sort of had an out-of-body experience. And it was a really stupid fight. It was about nothing. It was about like a text I got from another girl. And um, we both threw each other around the room. And um, but uh, it brought back all the sort of violence that I'd grown up with that I kind of like um, had stories that had been told about my father and his violence and his alcoholism and stuff. And it was like that, um, that scene from Fight Club or something. Like it all sort of like clicked into place. Like uh, this is me. I don't get to do this anymore. I've lost. Uh, all my drinking tickets are now expired. Uh, but I did want to do recovery and because I did want, I had heard about AA. I had been to meetings when I was 19 years old um, when I was coming off of psychedelics and kind of like had been institutionalized once or twice. But I didn't, it didn't really click for me. And so um, I finally did make it to a meeting. And, um, and at first, AA to me was a funeral. AA was... Uh, it was um, uh, we were all mourning the loss of our friend, dear alcohol, that laid out here in front of the table. And, uh, and that was enough. That, that kept me going to meetings until I heard the annoying people in the back of the room that had all this hope and faith. And I wanted, I, eventually, I wanted what they wanted. Um, and I didn't work a single step for nine months. I don't think I really talked to anybody for, for six months. And I don't recommend anybody do recovery like me. Um, and um, I started to work steps. And... Um, and coming out of denial into admission, and then moving from admission into acceptance, and then um, that was, these were big gaps. Like um, that, that distance between the first and second step. Like when I look back at it now, and when I try to walk a sponsor through steps, like that's a big one. Like <clears throat> I am fucked. Cool. And then there's there's hope, and that's like a big step. And so the, 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 like, they, they really get you with the steps. Like, you have to admit you're fucked and then take, take the step towards, like, like hope. And, um, <clears throat> like, who's got you? You know what I mean? And uh, anybody who makes that step is, like, is like a winner to me. You know what I mean? Because um, there's, like, uh, and it's a miracle, right? That's, like, that's where it happens. Um, and so... Um, I'm I'm humbled when I see it, and 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 then continuing to work the steps was awesome. Fourth and fifth step really cool. Um, I didn't really have a language for my emotions. I didn't know how to talk about them. I I learned about the difference between guilt and shame. <clears throat> um, I learned that guilt is not always a bad thing. Like guilt is a recognition that an act that I did needs amending. That's good. Shame is unnecessary, and none of us need to feel that. Because shame is <clears throat> the idea that some part of you is bad, and some part of you is unrecoverable, and some part of you um, can't make it. And that, 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 that shouldn't be the case. Um, and so 
I'm super grateful to have had a sponsor that um, listened to me because I'm long-winded, as you'll probably see. I'll probably go over. Um, <clears throat> because my, my fourth step had 150 people on it. <laughs> my fifth step took me three days to read. And on the second day, at like 2 o'clock in the morning, when I finally said, I'm fucking sick of this shit, my sponsor finally said, I'm so glad you finally saw that because he was sick of it after an hour. <laughs> but he needed me to get sick of it. And I try to do that for my sponsees now. I try not to tell them how to be. Like, I, I, like you need to see it. You need to experience it. You need to, like, uh, to cross talk. Ruby shared at this meeting the other day that, like, you need to <clears throat> fear and amends so much that you never fuck up again. You know what I mean? Like, I hate making amends. Um, and so I, 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 I try to be good. You know what I mean? Um, it's a lot of work. Um, uh, and so I just try, I try not to create the wreckage. I just try not to do it. And again, that, that works for me. That gets me out of a lot, hot, a lot of hot spots and stuff. Um, and my life is awesome today. I want to take a minute to breathe. My life is awesome today because um, if I would have uh, gotten the life that I wanted when I first walked in here, like if I would have written that down and somebody handed that to me now, it would have sucked. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago at this double speaker meeting uh, a, little, a little ways away, I met another alcoholic and, um, and uh, we put a life together. And uh, a couple of months ago, she married me. <laughs> and so, um, lots of really cool things happening here. <clears throat> lots of really cool things happening. And um, I have an amazing job where I get to um, focus and work for people's benefit. Um, I, yeah, I get to work and sort of like house people who don't have enough money to get housing. Um, that's pretty rad, and again, not a job that I sought out, sort of a job that kind of found me. Um, and I have a community of people um, that um, I am so grateful for, um, who do what I'm trying to do now, which is kind of like get up in front of each other and share a little bit about themselves. And I really appreciate this program, and I really appreciate everything it's given me, so thank you. Thank you. I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Ruby. Hi, Ruby. Hey, Ruby. I don't know if you guys knew, but I got married to somebody recently. <laughs> uh, who I actually met at this meeting when it was at the old church on Shattuck. Um, which is like a super palpable, really easy way to see the gifts of the program. Um, because he, the, the idea of doing all this step work is terrifying. And uh, I have spent my life trying to blame other people for things that I have done. And one of the things that got me through was hearing, like, the ninth step promises at all the meetings. Like, financial fear will slip away and we will realize that um, I just forgot. But you guys know it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I did that dance at the altar too. It was like this. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so I have so much time. Uh, I could just like tell you what I did today. You could do laps around it. I could. I could do laps. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, I got sober November fifteenth, twenty twelve, um, and I'll do some backtracking since we have so much time together. <laughs> um, I grew up in a really privileged home. I grew up on ranch land with a mom and a dad who both lived at home and didn't work and they were there around all the time. I have an older sister. And when I think about it, it was a completely idyllic childhood. Um, I grew, I went to school with the same 30 kids from kindergarten up until eighth grade when I changed high schools. 
And when we were bored, we would go outside and, like, find dead moles to mummify and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, see how high we could climb redwood trees and figure out which rocks, if you ground them up with water, made paint. Um, really cool stuff. Um, and I was completely and utterly miserable. Um, I think the first the first kind of sign that something was not completely right with me was when I was four or five and I got up from the kitchen table while we were having dinner and I ran into the bathroom screaming, I'm fat and ugly, and I locked myself in the bathroom and refused to eat. Um, which is hard for a little kid. Um, my dad is an alcoholic who... Uh, was sober, mostly, kind of ish, um, sober ish, uh, when I was young because he had gotten his third DUI and had gone to jail when I was a baby. And my mom gave him an ultimatum and she was like, drink again and you will never see us. And so he stopped drinking. Um, and so he would say that he was going to like PTA meetings and stuff all the time. <laughs> And I got so mad. It was a school board meeting. And I'd be like, Dad, why do you have to be on the school board? You're never home anymore. Um, so, uh, and my mom was a rageaholic. So she was miserable and sad, and um, she didn't like my dad. I don't necessarily blame her. Um... And she, but she took it out on us. So there was a lot of screaming and a lot of yelling. And um, most of the memories I can have of my mom when I was little is hiding in the closet with my hands out like this against the door because I knew she was coming. And I kept, and I would try to keep the doors closed um, because she was terrifying. You know, there was a Christmas Eve, um, and. My dad's family was coming that day for Christmas, and so we had to clean up our playroom, my sister and I. And <clears throat> it wasn't completely clean by, like, 8 o'clock at night. She wasn't feeding us. She wasn't, like, she, we were, she kept us in there until it was perfect. And I remember I tried to, like, run for the door to, to escape, and she slammed the door on my hand and almost broke my finger. And, uh... I remember because I was talking to Jesse about what Christmas was like when we were little kids. And I was like, I don't remember. It was fine, I think. And then I was like, oh, my God, I know why I don't remember. My mom tried to fucking break my hand. <laughs> uh, so it was, a, <clears throat> it was a challenging childhood in the way that my dad, it turns out, was high all the time. And so he kind of hid in his little apartment above the garage and didn't come down. And my mom was terrifying. And so there wasn't anybody who was really solid, um, who could really be present for your feelings. Um, because my dad always just kind of brushed it off and was like, you're such a cool kid. Don't worry about it. Those people suck. You know, he, he, he would try to encourage me to get in fistfights if some kid at school didn't like me. He still brags about a fistfight I had in third grade. And he's like, man, my girl, she beat up this guy. He was like twice her size. And I was like, we were eight, and you really should have been doing something different. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I totally forgot what I was going to say. Um, so childhood, awkward, follow, always felt like I didn't fit in, um, and I felt scared, and I felt insufficient, and so when I went to high school, I went to an arts high school where I could do choral work. I was a singer, and, uh, and I, my freshman year, there was a girl who was a couple years ahead of me, and um, I was really depressed. I think I had a crush on this boy, and we dated for like a day and talked on the phone, and then he broke up with me and said he was in love with his ex-girlfriend. Uh, and I was really sad as a 14-year-old, you know. Um, and so this girl sold me a bottle of vodka that was in her locker in a Sprite bottle, and it was super warm. I have no idea how long it was there. And I gave her $5. 
and I went to my dad's house, um, and I proceeded to hang out in my room alone, like chugging this lukewarm thing of vodka that tasted like plastic, and a diet peach snapple. (laughs) (laughs) And, And it was like the most incredible feeling of my life. Because I played alone a lot, and I talked to myself a lot, and to like 8,000 people in my mind. Um, And when I got drunk, I felt like there was like a party going on in my room alone. And it was really cool, and all of a sudden I didn't feel lonely. And all of a sudden I felt like I could go and I could beat my mom up. Let's go see. Uh, So... um, That was also, that was a part of it. So, mom, I'm going to do a lot of jumping around um, because people make me nervous and uh, because I like to hear myself talk, but in front of people, it's harder. Uh, So, that's, anyway. uh, (laughs) um, My parents got a divorce when I was 11. And it was a messy situation because my dad moved out finally on my sister's 13th birthday without telling anyone. (laughs) And uh, before that, he had been in the house because he got cancer and had to get radiation. And my mom was the only one who could take care of him. And because radiation was a lot more volatile back then, my sister and I were not allowed to be within 30 feet of him um, for a couple months and so we, I would call him on the phone um, when he was up in his studio to talk to him. And even though he was like just like a door away, I couldn't talk to or go near him. And my dad and my family was like the person who made me feel like I was okay because I'm like my dad. I'm a pretty loud, artistic, kind of kooky, you know, super duper kooky <laughs> alcoholic. Uh, and so is my dad. And, uh, and then I was stuck alone in the house with my mom and my sister and my sister, bless her wonderful, beautiful heart is difficult. (sighs) Yeah. And, uh, that was a rough time. It was really a challenge. My mom's best friend died in that same time period of cancer as well. So my mom was going through this grief and mourning. We were going through this grief and mourning. My dad was going through this grief and mourning, and we were all in this weird situation where it was like the people who could make us feel better weren't around. Um, because that's another part of my alcoholism is that I spend a lifetime seeking outside things to make me feel validated and to give me and feed me the feeling of being whole. Because alcoholism is a spiritual sickness. It's a, it's a, it's a sickness of the body, soul, and the mind. Um, I think I've, I've covered the fact that my mind is sick. Um, and, uh, and so it was, yeah. So when I first got drunk, when I was 14, it was amazing. Um, and then skip forward. I got the nickname drunky my senior year of high school. Um, (laughs) And that was my first aha moment. (laughs) That was my first, like, I have arrived moment. Because people knew me, and I was good at something. I was good at being that person at the party where you're like, watch out for this person, because that's going to be a story, and they won't be able to remember, so you can spin it any way you want. (laughs) And uh, it was great. Uh, it, I don't remember if it was great uh, because I don't remember. But it was cool having people remember me. That's the part I loved because I loved being in the spotlight, uh, especially if it evolved drama and pain and other people's boyfriends. I was like, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Because another part of my alcoholism is that I have a tendency to put men in the place of God. And so if I could convince another person's person to be with me, I was like wielding the power of God. And uh, because I had no connection whatsoever, 
alcohol completely severed any chain that linked me to something greater than myself. And that's a lonely place to be. So I went to college, um, and I went to an art school in Los Angeles because you didn't have to take the SATs. (laughs) (laughs) And I didn't want to stay home. Um, And I hated it because... Like I said, people make me nervous. And so I moved into a dorm, and I was a mess. Um, I had mostly lived alone my senior year of high school because my dad moved to Germany, so I just lived in his apartment. Um, And so I had been living alone already for a while, and it was great. Um, And so living in a going and then living in a dorm with a very... Very bubbly, red-headed <laughs> oboe player. <laughs> was a oh my god! Um, yikes! And uh, within my first week of college, I was invited to go to a party in LA, uh, in a place that I don't remember where it was. Um, but I put on like the most scandalous shirt I could find, and I went to this party, and I got totally blitzed and the last thing I remember is this wonderful guy who was in my class um this person and they were about six foot five and the most beautiful woman (laughs) and they came and like (coughs) pushed this dude off of me on a couch apparently I was like there was something happening and uh So that was mostly my college career. The only real part about it that I remember is that there were like a couple parties and they all ended pretty in a weird way. And I was failing all my classes because I don't like studying and I also don't know how to read music. So as a voice major, that's a challenge. (laughs) Uh, Because I like to do things the easy way. And I really like to do it kind of the cheaty backdoor way. Uh, And so I always just learned how to sing things by ear, and nobody ever really found out. Um, But then when you're in college, people find out, and they don't give you good grades. And uh, and so, ooh, we still got a lot of time, guys. It's going good. Um. I called another college that I had been accepted to, and they said they would still take me, so I packed up my dorm room and my Volvo, and I left during finals week, and I drove to Seattle, Washington. And I got my first real apartment living alone when I was 18, um, and I started going to a new school. And the interesting thing was that, I mean, I really like the word interesting, because everything's interesting. Um, um, And my mom came to visit me, and I realized that I hadn't been hugged or touched by another person in, like, four months. And I realized that's really lonely. Um, A lot Being an alcoholic is a lonely thing. Being an active alcoholic is miserable. Because the thing is, is that alcohol in my lifetime was the only thing that could give me a feeling of being full. But even if you filled up this entire room with booze and drugs, I'd still be immediately panicking about when it runs out. And, like, it's that idea in the seventh step that, like, um, the fear of losing what you have and the fear of not getting what you want. And it's like, that has ruled my world. Um... And so I, I worry a lot because I really like to have control over things. I like to have control over people and places and things and God and every other thing in the world. Um, and so when I worry about something, it gives me this false construct that I am controlling what's going on. Yeah. And um, I like to get really obsessive. Uh, and so that worry just gets in it. Um, anyway. So I met this guy when I was 19 in Seattle, um, and I lied and I told people that we 
met walking through the snow and he ran into me on the street and spilled coffee on me and he offered to buy me a new one and we fell in love right away and it was incredible. Um, and I met him on the website Plenty of Fish. <laughs> Uh, right? <laughs> there are plenty of fish out there, and some of them are funky. <laughs> Not trying to bash any character, just being real. So I met a super duper funky fish. Like, whoa. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> and so I did meet him in a coffee shop, uh, <laughs> because that's where we said online that we would meet. And uh, the second that he turned around in line, he was the, right in front of me in line, I immediately had this gut feeling there was something severely wrong with him. And I wanted to run. No, it's good. I like laughter. Validated. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to run at the door, but at the same time, I was really lonely, and I didn't give a shit who cared about me. As long as anybody like paid a, like a very mild amount of attention to me because I also felt like, you know, it's that like um, you feel like just the shit in the world and being sober makes you at least a useful piece of shit. Um, I heard that a couple years ago and I thought it was really funny. It's pretty self-deprecating, but uh, this is a sickness of the mind as well. And so my mind is a wretched little thing. Um but it's that idea that, like, I am the worst in the world, and I'm also the very best in the world. And I don't remember where I was going with that. But the idea was that I felt so bottom of the barrel that I couldn't do any better. And so uh, I was terrified of this guy. He looked really wrong. And three weeks later, he moved into my apartment. <laughs> And we were in love, and uh, he was driving my car and uh, borrowing money from me because his money was tied up in bonds in North Carolina. <laughs> he was actually a world-renowned deep-sea diver and all of this stuff. And, oh, I've traveled the world, and I used to live in Key West, and da 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 da, -da. I never saw a picture of this guy before the age of 20. He was 23. I never saw a driver's license. I never saw anything that could prove that he was who he was, and I believed him blindly because I just was desperate and lonely. And the only thing in the world that had ever given me a feeling of being full was an eating disorder, cutting myself, and alcohol. Uh, and so, of course, the logical progression is that I would fall stupid in love with this guy who beat the shit out of me and I had no idea because I told myself that if he didn't hit me in the face it wasn't abuse he never hit me in the face until he hit me in the face so a couple days before my 20th birthday he was arrested for destruction of property and domestic violence and I had to call my mom on the phone and she had to come to Seattle and rescue me. And there was this fucked up thing about it that when I went into the hotel downtown to check in, I checked in under another name and had this big, long black sweater on and these big glasses. Um, and I felt like I was a movie star. And it had gave me this feeling of, like, of fandom. Um, and when I checked in... And, like, I had bruise on my face, and I was, I was fucked up. And they treated me nice. Uh, and so uh, I checked into the hotel as Ella Fitzgerald. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to be found and you're a jazz singer, put your name under a jazz singer <laughs> who's clearly not around. Uh, <laughs> But it was, you know, I came, I moved back to my mom's house, and I really rode on that feeling of, like, there was this powerful feeling behind having a go bag in your trunk and having somebody follow you and, like, wanting you to be not alive <laughs> makes a person feel super fucking important. <laughs> um, and I rode off of that, and that's when my drinking got really crazy. 
because when I met him, he was also an alcoholic. Our first date, he showed up to the front door with like a 24 pack of Pabst Blue Ribbon and a carton of cigarettes wearing a, uh, a coverall. And I was like, hey, baby, <laughs> I like what you got in the box, I mean. Uh, <laughs> and so I drank because it was fun and it made me feel good. And then I drank because I wanted him to think I was as good as he was. And then I was drinking to forget that I was experiencing what I was experiencing. Um, because my alcoholism is progressive, but my bottoms are get progressively deeper and it never stopped. Um, so I was drinking at this person who was nowhere to be found. Um, but I was drinking like a crazy person to like prove to him that I was strong and that I could like live my own life. Um, and then when I was 21, uh, my best friend, Tristan, it turns out his birthday is today or would have been today. Um, he was killed in a motorcycle accident. And then that's when my drinking really completely made the switch because before that time I had always given myself an illusion that I could still control it. Um, I remember I was in finals week and I handed my, my mom, the ever codependent caretaker, I handed her my box of drugs and I said, mom, will you hold this up until I'm done with finals? And she took it. <laughs> she saved it for me. Uh, and then I was done with finals and I was like, Hey, I got an A. Can I have my box back? And she was like, yeah, I had it right here. You could have just come and gotten it. <laughs> but cool. Um, so when Tristan died, I lost my mind completely. Um, I had a dream that he had been in the accident but had survived and just had a really bad limp. And I woke up and I had a complete psychotic break because I, I could not separate that from reality. Um, and so I was looking for him. I was actively looking for a dead person. And so I dropped out of school again. Um, and I drank myself into oblivion, uh, to the point where I almost burned down my house and I started to feel like my skin didn't fit my body because my mind was moving so quickly and I could not stop talking to somebody who wasn't there. And so I started slamming my head on tables and trying to like burst through walls so that I could figure out how to be comfortable in my skin. Um, and so the natural progression to that is I got a job at the end of the bar, at the bar at the end of the street where you could smoke inside and uh, really just be a fucking mess. Um, and it was amazing. And it was my golf course moment, right? Because Bill in the book, he's like, Starts up high, kind of, but immediately he's like, there was love and applause and war. It's like all of these things coming together and they all have equal value and you can equally drink over all of them. Damn, I'm getting it. <laughs> um, I was so worried I wouldn't be able to talk for 40 minutes. It's like I didn't even know myself. <laughs> um, and that's how I would drink over anything. And so like, when I got so when I got drunk and I got a DUI, that was fine. People go to jail, no problem. Well, a week later, when I crashed my car into a six foot ditch and tried to drive out, no big deal. People do that all the time. Uh -huh. You know, when I woke up with a, I'm I'm Jewish, and I woke up with a neo Nazi who I didn't know, and apparently that night I had had sex with him, and we had had sex on a shotgun, and it broke. And could have killed us. I had no idea what the hell was going I mean, I got myself into these situations that I would have never. Uh, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Um, but I kept drinking because each time I was like, that won't happen again. And uh, I'll learn my lesson and it'll be fine. I just won't drink with that crowd of people. I'll bring somebody who will watch me. I will drink alone. Um... But it got to the point, and I did drink alone a lot, so much, all the time. Um, and so I got a job at this bar, and 
I was always had, I was really shaky a lot. And I always thought it was because I'm anxious. And I am a very anxious person. But I know what I had never, I didn't know about DTs. I didn't know about any of that. I also didn't know that it's not a completely normal and rational thing to do to put Kahlua in your coffee in the morning instead of sugar. Um, and so I had been drinking around the clock for years and didn't recognize it because I didn't want to recognize it. I had a bottle of whiskey by the door and I would take a swig anytime I left the house. And then of course I would always forget something. And so I'd go back into the apartment and grab my car keys and I'd go back to the door and I'd take another swig and then, oh, I forgot my wallet. And then I'd go back and I'd leave and I'd take a swig. Like everything I did included drinking. So at this bar where I worked, it got to the point where I was working one night and my hand was shaking so much and I was holding a drink and it like flew out of my hand because at the bar, I could just put drinks on somebody's tab and drink for free or go down to the bar and say that a table had ordered drinks and they hadn't. And so I'd have like five drinks stored under the cash <laughs> register and I would just be drinking all night. And then I would go to the 7-Eleven and I'd get two bottles of champagne and beer and whatever else I needed and I'd go home and I'd drink one bottle of champagne and I'd drink most of the bottle of whiskey and I'd get high out of my mind and because I couldn't still sleep, I'd have some beer and then I would take whatever I had in the house. Usually it was codeine, sometimes it was Vicodin pills I'd chewed if I was lucky. <laughs> um, and then I'd wake up and I'd do it all over again. Um, and, uh, so the bottom that I ended up having was that at this bar, the guy who owned it would always dress up as Hugh Hefner on Halloween and he'd have bunnies. And so I got to be a playboy bunny and I was like, I have made it. <laughs> Because uh, he would frame these giant pictures of the Playboy bunnies on the wall. Uh, and so I felt really cool. And uh, so, and he had taken us to Frederick's of Hollywood, and we got to miss a day of work and drink at, like, 1 in the afternoon. And he spent, like, hundreds of dollars on lingerie for us, because that's not creepy. Um, and so I dressed up. <laughs> hey, 75-year-old guy, yeah, you dress me up like that. <laughs> I have no morals. Uh, and um, I think I made it through about 15 minutes of the Halloween night and the last thing I remember is that I took a shot of tequila and that was it oh and that somebody had handed me a couple pills and I had, don't know what they were and then I was awake in the morning sitting on the front porch of the bar having a cigarette having a conversation with my friend and I was covered in cuts and bruises I had no idea what had happened um, and I found out later that like pretty much right after I'd taken that shot of tequila, I'd fallen and I destroyed the outside bar and I tried to climb up the stairs of the bar and I'd gotten rug burns all the way up and down my body. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the worst bottom of my life. But it was the point at which I couldn't take it anymore. And I was sick of people looking at me that way. And I was sick of feeling like, like nothing. Like I had nothing. Like I had no value. Um, and so I went to Chicago, Illinois to go to rehab. And, um, and it was the most amazing experience of my life. I started making my bed every day. And I would get up before all the other ladies and they opened the smoke deck at 5 o'clock. And so I'd wake up at 5, and I'd make the coffee, and I'd go out on this deck, and I would check my iPod, iPad, thing, iPod, whatever it was back in the day. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I would listen to Sufjan Stevens on this deck, drinking hot coffee, smoking a cigarette, watching the sunrise over a frozen lake. And it that was like my first kind of spiritual experience was the fact that I could wake up and watch the sunrise. Um, and I got home and I moved here to Oakland. I've never had a drink in Oakland, which I'm extremely grateful for. Um, and I started coming to meetings and I was actually dry for about six months. <coughs> and one night after work, I called a buddy of mine and I asked him if he wanted, I was going to ask him if he wanted to go to bar with me to like have a non-alcoholic 
beer and like so I could be with my people. Um, and I when I got a hold of him, I was like, hey, Tom, will you go to a meeting with me? Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, and so I started going to meetings. And one of the meetings I started going to was this one. And, um, and I immediately got into service. And I immediately got a sponsor that night, the person who was speaking. I just went up to her and I was like, please be my sponsor. I'm going to die. Because the thing is, is that I will die from this. I have spent years digging this massive grave that is infinite because my bottoms could always get deeper. It can always get worse until I'm dead because that's the part of my alcoholism. There is never going to be enough. There will never be enough to validate and to quench the thirst of a spiritual sickness. It's not possible. Um, and so I got a bunch of commitments. I had a commitment here that I did really badly with Michael. Uh, he was really nice about it. And, uh, <laughs> and I made my whole world about this program because I wouldn't have a world without this program. And I am here where I am now having met my husband <laughs> at this meeting. Um, and because I was able to, I was able to go back to school and get a degree and I was able to figure out what I really wanted to do. And nothing comes before Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, because somebody was there for me and was willing to give up their time for me. And somebody had a seat. I remember my first meeting in Oakland was chips and cake. And I sat next to this woman who was a complete stranger. And she gave me her domino in case I got called. Um, and there were just countless amounts of people who just were willing to give love freely because that's part of this program that we get in recovery is that there is love without consequence and there is joy without waiting for the other shoe to drop. And there can be contentment even in that fear of losing what you have and maybe not getting what you need or want because everything works the way it's meant to work. And when I was, and when I was in actively in my alcoholism, there's this part in the fourth step and it talks about how it, it may seem that you have been victorious, but there's like, you may have won the battle, but you don't win the war because this is a war. And so we're all get. I mean, it's not. War is terrible, and I don't think that Bill should have been, there was applause. And anyway, um, that was a tangent. I don't know. <laughs> I'm full of them. Because it turns out it's a thinking problem, and so my thinking is really fucking weird. <laughs> and so I always psych myself out when I'm about to share because I'm like, man, I'm all over the place, and all, uh, none of the things I say have value, and it's like, oh, hold on the way I think is kind of scattered and cuckoo. And then I come to this place that's really warm and loving and it's all fine. So why would I share any differently? <laughs> I am who I am. Um, is that a thing or I'm, okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you all have places to be. <laughs> what it's like now, uh, I go to meetings. I have three sponsees. I have two separate sponsors. I work another program as well. I have a job that I show up to every day. I took a day off this last week, and I told them a month in advance I wasn't going to be there. <laughs> uh, and I reminded them, too. And I took that day off to go to the DMV and take my dog to the vet and do, like, human things. Um, and I still make my bed every morning. And I still just do the things that make this life worth living. Because the steps may be challenging, and it is hard, and it is rigorous, and doing a fourth step in a way where you really look at the way that you hurt another person, and own it, and have that, what you said, like, not having the shame, but having the understanding, and being able to do a ninth step, and show up for somebody's feelings, and not try to fix it, not try to change it, is an incredible gift that I would have never gotten, because I never wanted to take any responsibility for anything in my life. Um, and it's really cool. And I really am so grateful that I got to share for you. Thank you for sitting through that uh, lifetime movie and <laughs> you're welcome and good night. <laughs>
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.